Ну что же, добрый день, добрый день, дорогие друзья. Меня зовут Аслан Тусубжанов, и я очень рад приветствовать всех вас на втором дне нашего замечательного фестиваля Go Viral 2020. Вчера у нас был первый день, и позвольте мне поделиться с вами о том, что у нас происходило в первый день нашего фестиваля. Во-первых, у нас было три keynote спикера. Это Брэндон Эндрюс. Он рассказывал нам о том, как развивать и вести свой бизнес во время и после пандемии. Далее у нас был Самсон Безмятежный, который рассказывал о технологии VR, а также как эта технология может быть применима в разных сферах нашей жизни. И вечером в 9 часов вечера по времени Алматы у нас выступала Радхика Мальпани, которая поделилась своим 20-летним опытом в компании Google. Также вчера в 8 вечера у нас была сессия воркшоп на платформе Zoom, которая называлась Speed Networking. Там участники могли поделиться своими идеями, проектами и задачами, ну и, конечно же, обменяться контактами. Давайте расскажу вам о том, что будет происходить у нас сегодня. Во-первых, утром, как всегда, вам на почту пришло письмо ссылкой на эту трансляцию, а также ссылкой на документальный фильм Фрэнка Поппера, который называется «Gentleman of Vision». Вы сможете посмотреть этот фильм в течение двух дней. Сейчас, буквально через несколько минут, в 16.30, у нас будет презентация от Владимира Вулича. Он расскажет нам, как создавать превосходный клиентский опыт. В 7 часов вечера по времени Алматы на платформе Zoom у нас будет воркшоп вместе с Айданой Амурбаевой на тему введения в DevOps Engineering. Очень важно вам напомнить, дорогие участники, что этот воркшоп будет на ограниченное количество участников, только 40 человек. Вот, так что не теряйте своего времени в 7 часов вечера, если вам интересна эта тема и вы хотите в ней поучаствовать, хотите побеседовать с другими участниками на эту тему, то присоединяйтесь в эту комнату на платформе Zoom, ведь как только наберется 40 человек, то комната закроется. Не теряйте вашего времени. В это же время в 7 часов вечера в 19.00 по времени Алматы у нас выступит Маркус Джей Бюллер на тему MIT, если бы вирус мог петь. Не забывайте, что те, кто не сможет посмотреть наши трансляции в прямом эфире, вы не переживайте, все наши трансляции останутся в записи на нашем YouTube-канале прямо здесь. Также во время выступления наших спикеров, дорогие друзья, если у вас появятся интересные вопросы для наших спикеров, вы всегда можете их задать в чате под трансляцией. Самые интересные и самые актуальные вопросы в конце презентации я задам нашему э, презентующему спикеру во время сессии вопросов и ответов. Мы также есть и в мессенджере Telegram. У нас есть два канала. Первый канал это GoViralKZ, где вы сможете прочитать всю актуальную информацию в режиме реального времени о фестивале Go Viral 2020. И есть второй канал Go Viral Chat, где вы сможете напрямую уже задать вопросы нашим организаторам. Любые вопросы связаны с нашим фестивалем, так что не беспокойтесь. Ну что же, дорогие друзья, у нас сегодня очень насыщенная, интересная программа. Не забываем, что у нас сегодня два спикера. У нас есть воркшоп в 7 часов вечера, к которому обязательно нужно присоединиться. Первый спикер будет рассказывать всем о том, как создать превосходный клиентский опыт. Это Владимир Вулич. А Маркус Джей Бюллер вечером расскажет о своем опыте в работе в университете MIT и а, расскажет, в принципе, а, о том, чем он занимается. Ведь он является а, специалистом по материаловедению и композитору по экспериментальной, классической и электронной музыке. Он интересуется обработкой звука. Я уверен, что вы точно не захотите пропустить этот, а, эту нашу лекцию. Вот такой у нас распорядок на сегодняшний день. Опять же, напомню, друзья, что те люди, которые пропустили первый день по той или иной причине, не смогли в прямом эфире посмотреть наши трансляции вчера, вы можете это сделать в любое удобное для вас время сейчас на нашем канале YouTube. Полная трансляция есть там вместе с лекциями, вместе с сессиями вопросов и ответов. Ну и сейчас у нас... Будет презентация от Владимира Вулича. Он расскажет, как я уже говорил, о том, как создать превосходный клиентский опыт. Владимир является экспертом в области стратегии э, цифровой трансформации. Он работал очень много лет с крупными и малыми организациями и помогал им решать проблемы в наш цифровой век. Он работал с организациями из абсолютно разных сфер. Это правительство, телекоммуникация, фармацевтика, организации, которые занимаются розничной торговлей продуктов питания, а, а также напитков. Среди его клиентов это программа развития организации Объединенных Наций. 
Федерации – это правительство Черногории, а также лаборатория социальных инноваций Загреба и много-много других. Владимир имеет 12-летний опыт преподавания в Университете Черногории стратегического менеджмента. Помимо всего прочего, он является основным докладчиком в 20 странах на четырех континентах – от Перу до Тайваня. Представьте, как нам сегодня вместе всем повезло. Также он трехкратно, трехкратно был докладчиком на всем известном мероприятии TEDx, включая и TEDx, который проходил в столице Хорватии Загреб. Напоминаю, что во время лекции Владимира Вулича, друзья, все интересующие вас вопросы вы можете написать в чате под нашей трансляцией. И э, в конце его лекции я задам все актуальные и интересные вопросы нашему спикеру. У нас будет в конце для этого время. И э, я думаю, он ответит на все, что вы хотите у него спросить, э, на все, что будет вам интересно. Сейчас давайте посмотрим, как э, у нас со связью с Владимиром. Итак, Итак, дорогие друзья, Владимир Вулич. Владимир, hello. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you're out. Where are you at the moment, by the way? I'm in the capital of Montenegro, Podgorica, and it's 30 minutes after noon, oh. so it's still a good day. It's yeah. so still a good day. It's it's a beautiful city. A couple of years ago, I've been to uh, Montenegro and traveled from Budva to, to Podgorica. It's one of the best places in Europe I have been, honestly, so it's a great place. Thank uh, you, man. Thank you're you're a happy... It. You're a happy man. I, I've just been to Budva yesterday, so I traveled back to, to the capital. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sending you some sunshine from Montenegro. It's oh. about 25 degrees today. Well, thank you very much. That is much needed because here, you know, the temperature are getting lower and lower each day. Well, Vladimir, thank you very much for joining us, for sharing your expertise and knowledge on this topic. I'm not going to postpone any further. I just want to remind our viewers that if they have any questions, they can ask them in chat right under our live stream. At the end of your presentation, there's going to be a Q&A session where I'm going to ask the most interesting and pressing questions from our viewers. And on this point, Vladimir, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much. Just let me share yeah. my screen. Yeah. It's still disabled by the administrator. So please just let the... Yes, I can share it right now. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. You can make, I think, yeah. Yes. So the title of my presentation today, of my keynote, is how to create a magical customer experience. So. I will begin a short story regarding TripAdvisor. You know that the TripAdvisor is American website, arguably the leading website in the world, when it comes to rating and leaving reviews about your stays in hotels, restaurants, and your travel experiences in general. So I will tell you a story about a hotel in Los Angeles. When you go to TripAdvisor, there are 378 hotels in Los Angeles. And when I say in Los Angeles, I do not mean only downtown LA. I mean the whole LA metro area. So including Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, and all the other mini cities within the LA metro area. So 378. And I'm going to tell you a story about sixth highest rated hotel in all of LA. So for a second now, I would like you to close your eyes and to try and picture what does the sixth best hotel in LA look like. So just close your eyes for a second. This will be an individual exercise and try to visualize how does, in your mind, for you, the sixth highest rated hotel in all of LA look like. 
Well, you can open your eyes now and let's see. Does it look like this? Well, for some of you, it certainly does. This is actually one of the highest rated hotels in LA. But for some of you, it maybe looks like this. This is also one of the highest rated hotels in LA. But maybe some of you have something else in mind. Maybe some of you had this in mind, a giant pool, palm trees, lots of sunshine. Well, this is probably how most of us would picture the sixth best rated hotel in all of LA. Well, now, I do not know what picture you had in your mind. But regardless of that, whatever you pictured, I know for a fact that what you didn't have in your mind was this. And this is actually the sixth best rated hotel in all of LA. The name of the place is Magic Castle Hotel. Now, can you imagine two words better than that? Magic and castle. And then you see this photo. This looks more like a motel in a B-rated Hollywood movie, painted in a bright canary yellow, than a magic castle hotel. So how on earth is it possible that this yellow dump can be the sixth highest rated hotel in all of LA? There has to be some magic behind it. Well, let's see. First, when you check in the hotel, you get the, this pink sheet of paper and on top it says snack list menu. And you're like, okay, most other hotels have snack lists. But then underneath it says compliments of the hotel. It means it's free. So you can get an unlimited supply of snacks while you are there completely free and even delivered to your room for free. So can you imagine having all of this for free whenever you want and even delivered to your room? Well, with this much candies, I wouldn't have any reason to actually go back to my house. This is a candy heaven. But now you're saying, okay, this is perfect if you're into sweets, but what if you don't like sweets that much? What if you don't have a sweet tooth? Well, there's another magical thing about Magic Castle Hotel, and that's free laundry service. And another thing, it's same day free laundry service. So you know that in most hotels worldwide, you have to pay for your laundry service and you have to pay dearly. And it prob unless you deliver it very early in the morning, you will probably have to wait for the next day. In Magic Castle Hotel, you get it on the same day and it's completely free. And now you're saying, okay, these two things are really good, but I'm still waiting for some real magic. Well, here it comes. Remember that ugly pool well, near that pool, there's this bright red telephone. And up, it says popsicle hotline, ice cream, ice cream hotline, popsicle hotline. So what happens? Where if you're a kid and you see popsicle hotline and you see a phone, you are obviously going to pick up the phone. And it, as soon as you pick up the phone, the voice on the other side says, Popsicle hotline, how may I help you? You're amazed and you say, I would like to have a popsicle by the pool. And within a few minutes, out comes a waiter with white gloves, a silver tray, and a selection of free 
popsicles. So you not only get a free popsicle, you get it delivered to the pool by the waiter with white gloves and on a silver tray. Now that's customer experience. And now imagine if you're a kid and you're taking a swim in a pool. There's absolutely nothing more magical for you than getting a free supply of Popsicle. And every time you pick up a phone, they bring you a new Popsicle. And now imagine you're a father or a mother and you brought your family to this place. It's obvious that your kid is going to have a blast and yet you will be extremely happy because of your kids having a magical moment in this place. So now it all makes sense. Now we understand why this place is actually called Magic Castle. They have figured out their target audience, their niche in a best possible way. And no, they are not trying to actually be the best hotel in LA. They're not even competing on that. They, are, they have figured out the needs of their customers and what are the places, the aspects, the pain points where they can serve them and actually deliver a magical customer experience. And these three things I have just described are actually that. And as a result, this place is the sixth highest rated hotel in all of LA. So now I'm going to tell you another story about a guy who they used to call the Ice King. The real name is Frederick Tudor, and he lived in the late 18th century and the first half of the 19th century. He was the founder and the owner of Tudor Ice Company and he actually invented ice trade. He was the one of the first self-made millionaires in the US. At the time, ice trade was the second largest commodity market in the world. Only cotton was bigger than ice. So how did he make his fortunes? Well, he was basically harvesting ice from the surfaces of ponds, of lakes in New England, the area around Boston, Massachusetts. So there's a lot of fresh water there, a lot of lakes, a lot of ponds. And during the late autumn and winter, the temperatures go well down. So during freezing temperatures, the surfaces of ponds freeze and the ice is completely free. So what is Tudor Ice Company doing? Well, they were harvesting ice from the ponds and then selling them to households. But then they figured out something else. What places in the US could actually have the need for so much ice? Well, obviously the hotter regions, not around Boston, but around Mexican Gulf, the south of US, Houston and the neighboring areas. Those were the areas where the cotton trade was very big. So there were boats shipping cotton from the south of US to Boston and surrounding areas. And when the ships were returning, they weren't carrying any commodity. Why? Because there was nothing to export from Boston to the south of US. So the ships, in order to have ballast, had to put huge amounts of rocks in ships. So what did Tudor say? He said, OK, I want to export, I want to trade this ice and ship it to the south of US. What can you do for me? Well, the captain said, look, originally we had to buy, we had to pay for the rocks in order for our ships to sail. 
Now you are offering something for free, which will enable our ships to sail without actually paying for the rocks. Okay, so the shipping is free. So now Tudor has free ice and he has free shipping. The only thing he has to pay is for the labor force who's actually harvesting the ice. And the trade exploded. He then started exporting to West Indies and at the prime of his business, he even exported ice to India. So he would put a huge brick of ice, 180 tons of ice, put it in a ship and send it to India. Roughly 50% of ice would melt and 50% around 100 tons would still be there. Since the ice was free and since the shipping was free, the margins on this trade were huge. So Tudor was making a lot of money. As I've said, one of the first self-made millionaires in America. So what in the world happened to Tudor Ice Company? Why didn't we actually learn about Tudor Ice Company in schools? I've never heard about Tudor Ice Company in schools. What actually happened? Well, it's easy. The obvious answer is widespread use of refrigerators happened. In 1913, refrigerators was invented. And in 1927, widespread use of refrigerators happened, which actually meant the end of the ice trade industry. But that's only the obvious answer. Is there something more specific that happened? Well, yes. What happened is that Tudor Ice Company actually confused their product with their customer needs. Now you're telling me what? There's a difference between the product and the customer needs. Well, yes, and the difference is huge, as you will see very soon. The product here is ice. You need ice for your cocktails. So the product is ice. But the customer need is not ice. The customer need is, I want my cocktails chilled and I want them to look good. So let me repeat. I want my cocktails chilled. If the people in the south of US needed their food to be chilled, to be kept cold, that's the customer need. The product in the beginning was only ice. However, at the time the refrigerator was invented, the product was refrigerator. So it's one thing to identify the customer need and a completely other thing to figure out what product will you actually use to satisfy that customer need. Tudor meant that ice was the customer need. In fact, ice was only the product the customer used to satisfy their needs. As soon as there were refrigerator, the need for Tudor's product was long gone. So now let's go to nowadays and see what's the difference between a product and the customer need. There's a famous story of a company called Stanley Works that produces drills. And they were in big trouble several decades ago. So they were hiring a lot of different management consultants and asking them to help, to figure out what's wrong with them. They were trying, they were doing all kinds of research, but they actually couldn't help them until one of the consultants actually talked to the customer. And he asked them, why are you buying Stanley Works drills? And the answer was, because I needed a hole. So I don't need your product. I have a need and my need is a hole. So I'm only using your product in order to satisfy my need and to drill the hole. So the consultant went back to the CEO and the board and he said, the people, your customers, they do not want to buy 
a quarter inch drill. They actually want a quarter inch hole. So you need to focus on their needs and then satisfying their needs. Once the Stanley worked, Works managers figured this out, the company skyrocketed. So now let's see the story about Rolex. There, the CEO of Rolex was at Wimbledon and he met his, the Wimbledon is the only, one of the only tournaments, one of the only places uh, Rolex actually sponsors. So he was having a drink, a champagne and uh, strawberries with whipped cream at Wimbledon with, with one of his friends. And then another of his friends passed by, saw the CEO of Rolex and he said, oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. How's the watch business going? And the Rolex CEO looked at him and he said, very seriously, I don't have a clue. I don't know. Rolex is not in the watch business. We are in the luxury business. And that's a huge difference. If you are in the watch business, the only customer need is knowing what the right time is, what the exact time is at the moment. But you can satisfy that need with a one euro watch. You can satisfy that need with turning on your TV. You can satisfy that need looking at your cell phone. So there's no real need for you to have a watch in order to know what the exact time is. But if your need is actually to show off your wealth, to show off your social status, to signal to the world, I'm richer than you, then you are in the luxury business. And then that's what Rolex is actually doing. So satisfying the needs of people within the luxury business. So what are the features of the watch then? It doesn't matter if it's actually going to be late two seconds within one year. That's not the business of Rolex. The business is, does it look good? Does it look expensive? What material is it made from? Is it easy for people who are looking at my watch to actually realize that it's a Rolex, that's why the crown is so big. Okay, so now you go to CEOs of your companies and ask them, is your company actually offering superior customer experience? So is your company able to provide magical customer experience? And 80%, 8 80% of CEOs say yes. Yes, of course. Our company delivers superior customer experience. Okay, right. But now you go to the customers and ask them the same question. And only 8% of the customers will agree. So 80% of CEOs, 8% of customers. 10 times the difference. So what are you then going to do as a CEO? Will you just give your customers a middle finger or are you willing to become the customer experience superhero? Well, since you are all here and you are, since almost 2000 of you are actually listening to this, I'm pretty sure that you've already made up your mind we are all going to be customer experience superheroes. So here's to you and here's to all customer experience superheroes out there. And now it's time to see how to actually create a magical customer experience. Well, before actually creating it, we need to answer the basic question. What is our business? And in order to do so, there are actually five important questions that we need to answer. And these five questions were proposed by Peter Drucker, the most famous management thinker in history. So he said, in order to answer the question, what is our business? You first need to answer, 
what is our mission? Who is our customer? What does our customer value? What results do we seek? And what is our plan? Only after answering these five questions, we'll be able to, answer, to know what is the business of our company. So let's see some examples. Well, here's Starbucks. What is their business? What is the business of Starbucks? Well, now you're saying, well, this is easy. Starbucks is a chain of coffee places, the biggest coffee chain in the world. Well, that's the obvious answer, but I need you to think deeper. Try to answer those questions from Peter Drucker and try to actually see what's the customer need and what's the product. So what's the need here? Well, if you ask their managers, they will tell you that Starbucks is not in the coffee business serving people. Starbucks is in the people business serving coffee. And that's a huge difference. If you are in the coffee business, then you are focused on creating the best coffee possible. However, if you are in the people business, who you just seem to be serving coffee, you are there to provide the best customer experience for your people, for your clients. And then serving them co coffee is just a byproduct. Why? Because maybe your customers like tea. So you can serve them tea. Maybe they would like a cookie. So you can serve them cookie. Maybe they would like a sandwich. Maybe they would like free Wi-Fi. Maybe they would like air conditioner. So their job is actually the people business. And then they will serve you whatever you want. The original name of the company was Starbucks Coffee. But after realizing this, they just shortened it to Starbucks. You can go to Starbucks and you do not need to order anything. You can sit down, you can enjoy the air conditioner, you can enjoy the free Wi-Fi, you can enjoy the free electricity, you can use your laptop, you can be there all day. And no one will ask you, why haven't you ordered? And could you please leave if you're not going to order? Why? Because they say that they want to create the third place in America. First place is your family. Second place is your office, your work. And third place is where you go to relax and maybe do some work. So creating the atmosphere where you feel welcomed is actually their business. The other thing in Starbucks is that you can basically order anything you want. So you can literally make up any combination you want and they will make it for you. So choose the type of drink, choose the type of whipped cream, choose the type of nuts, choose the type of sweetener and mix your own concoction. So the abundance of choice. But that's not the only way to make a customer, magical customer experience. You can go to the other end and you can limit the choice as much as possible. in and out Burger is actually creating a magical customer experience by dramatically limiting customer choice. Because as they say, in the world of abundance, simplicity might actually be the most creative thing to do. So you can have a burger or a double burger, French fries, Coca-Cola, and milkshake. And that's it. But you're like, when I go to McDonald's, I can have a wrap. I can have a fajita. I can have a chicken burger. I can have a fish burger. I can have a pie. I can have whatever I want. And they will gladly tell you, you can go to McDonald's. Why? Because they serve only burgers, double burgers, fries, Coke, and milkshake. 
not frozen and made to your order. That's what they make. If you don't like it, there are other places they can serve what you maybe want. But this is what they serve and they make it the best. Okay, let's go to another example. Harley Davidson motorcycles. What is their business? Well, now you would obviously say motorcycles, but because of the few previous examples, you're now thinking and trying to answer the four questions by Peter Drucker. So what might it be? Everyone else produces motorcycles, but what is so special about Harley? Well, now you're getting there, like freedom, open road, adventure. Well, if you ask their managers, they will tell you what we sell is the ability for a 43 year old accountant to dress in all black leather, ride through towns and have people be afraid of him. So that's what we sell. You dress in black leather, you hop on a Harley, you turn on the engine, and when people see you, they are actually afraid of you. So the, the stereotype of a 43-year-old accountant, the most boring person in the world, turns in just a few minutes, thanks to our product, in a person who people are afraid of. This very cool guy. That's what they sell. Okay, so what does Nike sell? Well, by now, you know that the correct answer is not shoes and it's not sports gear and sports equipment. But what is it? Try to think. Why would you buy Nike instead of Adidas, instead of Puma, instead of Asics? What is it that makes Nike so special? Well, their managers like to say that everyone sells shoes, but only Nike sells cool. You may not like the design of Nike, but what you know for sure is that the amount of technology that's put in your shoes is not rivaled by any other company in the world. The most developed, technically, technologically developed, most advanced shoes in the world will always be a Nike shoe. That's why if you're a sci-fi nerd like I am, and you remember the movie Back to the Future, you will know, you will remember that there was a Nike product placement in the movie. Why? Because even if you go to the future, the most advanced shoe will always be Nike. And those were the legendary self-lacing shoes. So as I said, if you are a nerd like I am, your dream since watching that movie was to have the self-lacing shoes. Nike tried it several times. They were a few prototypes. But then last year, the first ever shoe, self-lacing shoe that you can actually buy in a shop, which is not a limited edition, was launched. So it comes up together with a self-smartphone app so the only thing you need to do is to install the app on your phone and you will see the slider in the app. L, R, left, right. And you slide the app up to unlace your shoes and slide down to tighten to lace the shoes. And you can lace your two shoes differently. So now you're saying, okay, this is perfect if you're a nerd, but why on earth do I need to have this? Well, because the same technology will be licensed to other brands and will be used for medical purposes. So if you have a bad back and you cannot bend down to lace your shoes, you can use self-lacing shoes. If you have Parkinson's and your hands are trembling, you can actually use self-lacing shoes. So this is not just for the nerds. Okay, another example, Revlon. What is their business? They are in the beauty business, obviously, but what is it? 
what would you say is the business of Revlon? Well, if you ask their founder, he would say, in our factories, we make cosmetics. But in our store, we sell hope. See that he didn't say beauty because you cannot actually buy beauty. You cannot go to a store and sell, give me 2.3 kilos of beauty. But what you can actually buy is hope. Hope, story, that once you've put on Revlon products, you will look like Jessica Alba. So that's the story. That's the hope. That's the image you are projecting in your brain and you are actually buying. So the chemistry part, making cosmetics, is for the factory. The stores sell you hope, sell you dreams. This is Grimaldi's pizzeria under the Brooklyn Bridge in Brooklyn, New York. One of the most famous pizzerias in the world. So what is their business? Well, by now, you will probably say that their business is actually like Starbucks, the people's business. Creating the best customer experience and then serving you pizza. However, it's not. It's completely opposite. They do not care about customer experience. They care about making the best pizza possible. So you will see that Grimaldi's do not accept credit cards. You need to buy by cash. You cannot reserve your place. You need to stay in line sometimes for more than an hour. You cannot order a slice of pizza. You can or only order a whole pie. But you're like, I can't eat a whole pie of pizza. I can't eat a whole pizza by myself. And they're like, we don't care. You can either buy the whole pizza or leave. And there are no deliveries. You actually need to go there. But you're like, I'm working. I'm stuck in my home. And I would like a piece of Grimaldi's. Why can't I order? Well, we don't do it. Because the only thing Grimaldi's care about is actually making the best pizza possible. So if you try to complain, why don't you accept credit cards? They will gladly tell you. There are hundreds of other pizza places in New York that actually accept credit cards. I don't want to wait in line for an hour. Well, there are hundreds of other places in New York where you can reserve a place. You do not need to come to our place. So the story here is there is no one best way for you to create a magical customer experience. Starbucks is in the people business serving coffee. And Grimaldi's is in the pizza business serving people. And both are actually providing magical customer experience. So the deal here is for you to know your customer so well and to know what their needs are. Is their need the best pizza ever? Or is their need a perfect place where I can relax and then maybe get some coffee and then deliver it to them? Well, most of you have probably watched Frank Underwood and most of you probably like the show House of Cards. And you know that the place where Frank Underwood likes to go, where he has a craving for barbecue, is Freddy's barbecue. And then while he's there, while he's eating, you remember him talking a lot with Freddy. And then at one point, it almost looks as two of them are friends. They're buddies. And then if someone asks you, okay, so why is Frank Underwood going to Freddy's? you might be tempted to say, well, because Freddy is his friend. He likes to go there. He likes to speak with Freddy. 
because Freddy is the only person in the world who actually listens to him and gets him. That sounds very like, like a hallmark moment. But when you actually ask Frank Underwood in the show, why do you go to Freddy's? He says, well, it's mostly because of the effing ribs. He doesn't care about Freddy. What he cares are ribs. The best ribs he thinks he can get in Washington. He likes the ribs. He doesn't care about the experience. He doesn't care about Freddy. So creating a customer experience is a tricky thing. Sometimes it's about the thing you're serving. Sometimes it's about the experience, but it's always about knowing your customer and knowing what your customer values and then delivering it to him. What is the business of Beats, Beats by Dre? There are thousands of companies who are making headphones. Some of them are cheaper, some of them are more expensive, some of them have poorer sound, some of them have much better sound, some of them are ugly, some of them are better looking than Beats. So what is the secret to Beats? What is actually the business of Beats by Dre? Well, the actual business is that Beats is a culture company as much as a consumer electronics company. What does it mean? Well, it means that once you see celebrities wearing Beats, you see LeBron James going out to the court to the NBA Finals against Miami, and he's wearing Beats. You see Lady Gaga in her video wearing Beats. You see Emily Ratakowski on the street wearing Beats. And then they are selling you the culture part, the dreams part. I want to be as cool as them. So I want my beats. Now take a look at this photo and try to think for a few seconds. What could be the business of these people? And now, Look at this photo and try to think what is the business of these people? Well, the obvious answer would be they are window cleaners, both in the first photo and in the second photo. However, that's only the easy part. The hard part is actually figuring out the needs. This photo is taken in the kid's hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So yes, these guys are cleaners, but their job is actually not to clean. Their job is to make the lives of the poor kids who are in the hospital better and more exciting and something to hope for. So these kids here are already having a miserable day. So how can we make it better? Well, they want to see superheroes. They want to see Spider-Man. They want to see Batman. So these people are here to actually make their day better and to make the magical customer experience for the kids. Cleaning the windows is just a byproduct of this. So I'm going to end my talk with the story of my professor and a dear friend, Alfaren, from Finland, who was my guest in Montenegro about, let's say, 10 years ago. And he was supposed to give a few talks at the university I was teaching in. So he did one talk, and, one, and my professors and my dean were super excited. So we were out for lunch, and we had and uh, my professor had a great idea, what he thought was a great idea. And he said, Vanya, could you please talk to Professor Ren and ask him if he would be willing to give a lecture to our MBA class? That's about 250, 300 students. And I said, okay, when? And he said, at 3 p.m. I looked at my watch and I was like, but it's, 2 p.m. now. 
yeah, yeah, I, that's what I meant, in an hour. And I'm like, but do students know that they need to show up at 3 p.m. for the lecture? And he said, no, no, they don't have a clue about it. it that's the idea that just came to my mind, but we can post it on our website and people will see it and they will come. And I'm like, but no, they, they will not be able to see it within just an hour and then go to the university in order to listen to this professor. Yes, yes, they will trust me on this. Just ask the professor and then call the administrator of the website and make the information public. I didn't think it was a good idea, but I had to ask the professor and Professor Alfred said, yeah, of course, I will do that. I will be there in an hour and I will deliver a talk to 300 students from your MBA class. We went there 10 minutes before three and there was exactly zero people in the audience, which was normal, which was completely logical. No one knew that there's a talk by Professor N and even if they could, they couldn't organize within just one an hour and make it to the university. So we waited five to three, still zero people in the room. 3 p.m., one person shows up. 3.02, two people show up. 3.05, three people show up. I walk to Professor Ren and I say, okay, Professor, here's the deal. No one showed up. You do not need to do this and we can go out now. And he said, what, what do you mean no one showed up? Well, I said, look, no one showed up. There was supposed to be 250, 300 people here and no one showed up. And he said, no, no, no. Three people actually showed up. And I said, yeah, but that's three people. We were expecting a few hundred. And he said, but three of them actually showed up and they are expecting to see me talk, to see me perform. So I'm going to do this. And I said, but you don't have to. We can go out with the three of them to the pub and then we can talk. And he said, no, no, no. They wanted a performance in this room and I'm going to give it to them. And he gave one of the best talks I've ever heard. And once he was done, I approached him to say thank you and to congratulate him. And he said, Vanya, remember this one thing. The size of your audience doesn't matter. What matters is that you do your work and you do it the best way possible. And that's the one lesson I've learned and I'm trying to do even nowadays. So my final words to you in this keynote is I'm going to quote Walt Disney, which he said, whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again. But not only that, they will want to tell their friends and to bring their friends to show them how well you are doing what you are doing. So if you do your job so well that people want to bring their friends to show them how actually you are doing your job, that means that you're creating a magical customer experience. So here's to you and here's to creating magical customer experiences. Thank you. And now I'm ready for a Q&A session. Hey, Vladimir, thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. That was truly interesting. We've been on a small uh, roller coaster for a little bit. Uh, Vladimir, you're there, right? Yes, yes, I'm right here. Yeah, so I have several questions from our viewers. And the first Ooh, one uh, is, the person says, now everyone are trying to sell products in uh, Social, in social networks and how do you properly build your strategy uh, so that the clients will, won't feel that you know someone's trying to uh, uh, push a product on him because uh, Instagram in Kazakhstan is turning into a flea market at the moment. Yes, I, I saw some of the stats when it, when it 
comes to Kazakhstan and when it comes to social social media. So I could see that uh, Instagram was really, really, really big. Uh, most of what I was saying were, let's say, examples from physical life. So real life delivery when it comes to the experience. However, uh, basic principles are actually the same even when we are talking about online and when we are talking about social media. Especially during this pandemic, a lot of businesses who had actually zero participation on internet and social media, zero presence, had to start, had to at least start making their products or services available. So one of the things you can actually, the first thing you can actually do is to realize what business are you in? What customer need are you trying to fulfill? You are trying to satisfy. And then try to build a story around it. Since you will not be there physically present, people can't see you, they can't touch you, they can't feel you. Try to tell a story and then try to engage your audience, try to engage your users in a way that you want their stories to actually be heard. Mm -hmm. So talk to your customers and then ask them, how are you using our products? In what way our products are helping you? Mm -hmm. What are the ways our products are actually making your life better? And then feature their stories on your social media channels because you are not there to help yourself. You are there to help your users. So let other users actually see how the community is evolving. So try to make the community around your product. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, here's another question that's a little bit connected to that. Who are the people that should build the systems? Are they the marketing specialists or some other profession, maybe a new profession? Who are you talking about? Uh, the best way possible is if you have a founder who is really keen on these things and then the founder can help you do these things. However, that's, that's let's say, the situation where we have a startup, we, where we have a business that is just starting. However, these principles can be used in well-established companies which are more than 100 years old where the founder is long gone. So these people can, let's say the perfect mix would be a psychologist and a marketer. So yes, you can only be a marketer, but you, need, you don't need to have a degree in psychology, but you need to be able to empathize. You need to be able to understand the needs of your clients and then figure out the way to deliver something that's going to satisfy these needs. Okay, thank you very much for answering that question. Here's another one. Do loyalty programs really work? Uh, the person is saying that uh, coupons for a free coffee or uh, you know uh, discounts or a cashback system or something else because this person realizes that all her bonuses are burning up and her coffee coupons, she always loses them. So do loyalty programs really work? Uh, let's say good loyalty programs work. There's a difference be between just having a loyalty program and having a good loyalty program. I will tell you that I get automatically signed up to a lot of different loyalty programs as soon as you buy something, but most of these cards I do not carry with me and I don't have them often with me. Why? Because as, as the viewer asked, most of these actually suck. However, I have a story to tell you specifically regarding the coffee business for which the question was. There is a, a coffee place in UK which has a disloyalty program. So what are they doing? They hand you, hand you over a piece with like 10 coupons and each coupon is for another coffee shop. So they are basically giving you free coffees, which you need to drink in their competing coffee places. So you, you go to a competing coffee place, you give them a coupon and they will give you a free cup of coffee. So now you're asking why on earth 
would someone be giving you free stuff at the competition places? Well, there are two things. The first thing is we are so sure, so positive that our product, our coffee is that good that we are letting you try the competitors for free and we are certain that you will like our product better and then you will return to our place and be our user. The other thing is that we want to build the community of quality coffee drinkers. So even if you prefer some of the quality shops, which are our competitors, once you are used to quality coffee, you will no longer go to all these shitty places. You will pick one of these places, including ours. So this loyalty programs can sometimes work even better than loyalty programs if you are 100% sure that what you are actually offering is of value to your customers. So if I understand properly, the uh, best ingredients for creating a good, a really good working loyalty program is first of all, that uh, the, the superiority of your product and creating a really good uh, customer uh, community, a very interesting, cool maybe customer community that will be very interesting to be a part of. Is that it? Is, is that what I get? Exactly. That's it. And then using the people in your community to actually tell the stories Remember what Walt Disney said, if you are doing a very good job, a great job, an excellent job, a magical job, then the people in your community will not only continue to buy at your place, they will tell the story to their friends, bring in their friends and the community will grow. Mm -hmm. One more question here. Uh, how do you teach your team to react to negative reviews or negative uh, feedbacks from customers? How do you teach uh, your employees to react to that? that? That's a very good question because everyone loves fantastic reviews and fantastic yeah. grades. So when you go, for example, uh, we mentioned TripAdvisor. So you go to your TripAdvisor page and there are glowing ratings and fabulous reviews and everyone in the team is happy. And then in comes a bad one and we are all down. We are drowning. The secret here is to realize that you first, you cannot be all things to all people. That's very important. We are not out there to please every single customer in the world. So the first thing is to actually see what is the complaint about. If the complaint is about the product or the experience we have delivered in the best way possible, but our customer doesn't like it that way, that's perfectly fine. You need to be polite, say, Thank you for trying us. Thank you for reviewing us. Thank you for rating us. We are sorry your experience with our product or service is not stellar. However, we would recommend you use and then recommend some of your competitors mm -hmm. because that's probably what he or she needs. Second thing is if the review mentions something you did wrong. Yeah. So the quality of the product was not good and it was supposed to be good. So that's actually getting that kind of review is actually the best thing that can happen both to your team and your organization. Because that's, uh, that means that the people who left that review actually do care about your business. Mm -hmm. So they actually want to help you, to let you know, and to help you make your business better. So that's a learning point for all of us. And the important thing for you to communicate to your team that these type of reviews are actually learning points for you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for answering that question. We have one more question here. Uh, the question is this. 
should the small size companies think about this kind of stuff or it's just you know the uh, giants of the industry or the big players uh, in the market should the smallest uh, you know companies just one floor or one room uh, little companies think about that this is exactly the stuff that the small players should be thinking of mm. it's usually rather normal for a small let's say bakery to know their customers sometimes even by name mm -hmm. and to know their needs it's very hard for the big guys to behave in a way so if you have one bakery it's easy if you have two bakeries it's still okay if you have 10 bakeries if you have a hundred or a thousand bakeries and then in each one of those you want to provide personal serv personalized service yeah. and a magical customer experience that's very hard so that's why most of my talk was actually geared toward bigger companies why because the small guys actually do get it if you go to a small coffee shop in your neighborhood so two buildings away from the place you live the guy most probably knows your name and the guy most probably knows what kind of coffee are you actually having so when you enter the place he calls you by your name. Hi, Vladimir, nice to see you. Is it the usual for you? And he will never ever say what the usual is because he knows it mm -hmm. and you know it. I mean, I've been going to the same hairdresser for almost three decades now. And never ever in my life did I have to actually tell him what kind of haircut do I need? Well, that's the best because experience. He knows. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. is the best experience. So what your viewer asked, it's exactly the small businesses, the micro businesses that should be using this to the best way possible. Great, great. Thank you very much for answering all those questions. Well, that's it for questions. So just another remark, uh, all of our viewers said, uh, commenting that the presentation was very interesting and examples you have given are very interesting. They also were very, uh, you know, happy to find out that you're a, a nerd in a way. They were, uh, you know, very interesting to see your backgrounds. Uh, it's a little, you know, uh, uh, secrets for the for, for people who are interested in that kind of stuff. And anyways, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Master Yoda is saying, May the force be with you. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it, it, will, it will be. Vladimir, thank you very much for connecting to us thank in this beautiful much. afternoon from a beautiful country of Montenegro. It was a pleasure to talk to you, to hear you present. I thank you for joining us for this festival. I hope that the time was great to you too. Thank you very much. This has been a fantastic experience. Thank you for being a great host and a great MC. I'm really glad you've been to my country and you like yeah. the country. And I really hope that uh, a lot of your viewers will actually come to Montenegro once the pandemic is over. And I really look forward to the next edition of Go Viral and then visiting Almaty in, in person. So okay. this this hour flew by literally in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you a lot. That's, that's uh, honey to my ears. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to see you, to talk to you. Have the best day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ну что ж, дорогие друзья, это был Владимир Вулич, он рассказал нам о самых лучших примерах о том, как создать самый лучший клиентский опыт. Давайте сейчас немного расскажу вам о программе, о дальнейшей программе сегодняшнего дня, но перед этим не забывайте о каналах Go Viral в Телеграме. У нас там есть канал Go Viral KZ, где вы можете прочитать всю актуальную информацию о нашем фестивале в режиме э, настоящего времени. Также есть канал Go Viral Chat, где вы можете задать вопросы напрямую нашим организаторам э, о всем, что касается нашего фестиваля. Конечно же, мы еще раз хотели бы выразить огромную благодарность дипломатической миссии США в Казахстане, а также Акимату города Ламаты за помощь в организации этого фестиваля. Конечно же, большое спасибо и партнерам нашего фестиваля. Это Smart Point, Eurasia Foundation, American Film Showcase, American Music Abroad, Drama KZ, Театр Место Д, Театр Ильхом и Театр Артишок. Ну и наши медиа-партнеры. Это Blue Screen Казахстан, We Project Media, Окно, The Village, бизнес и власть, а также 18 Plus Idea. Друзья, у нас э, сейчас будет небольшой перерыв, но не забывайте, что в 7 часов вечера у нас на платформе Zoom будет очень интересный воркшоп, который будет вести Айдана Амурбаева. Воркшоп будет называться «Введение в DevOps Engineering». 
Помните, что количество участников на этом воркшопе у нас ограничено, всего 40 человек смогут принять в нем участие, поэтому не теряйте времени, если вам интересна эта тема, и заходите в Room на платформе Zoom этого воркшопа, потому что как только 40 человек наберется, воркшоп начнется, и эта комната закроется. Также в это же время, в 7 часов по времени Алматы, у нас будет еще один keynote спикер по имени Маркус Джей Бюллер. Его темой будет MIT, если бы вирус мог петь. Он вообще очень интересный человек, он ученый, профессор инженерии Макафи в Массачусетском э, технологическом университете, том самом знаменитом. Он является специалистом по материаловедению и композитором экспериментальной, классической, а также электронной музыки. У него есть очень много интересного, чем он хотел бы с нами сегодня поделиться. Поэтому я уверен, что никто из вас, кому интересна эта тема, ну даже и те люди, которые в этой теме не разбираются, не захочет точно пропустить эту презентацию. Ну что ж, друзья, у нас небольшой прерыв. До следующей встречи.